An electronic load proves to be a very useful lab instrument when we need to verify that a power supply is capable of providing its nominal voltage, current and power. It comes also useful to load a power supply to see how the residual ripple changes with the increase of the load, so we can fine-tune the filtering done to reduce it. Today, we will learn how electronic loads work, and we will use this knowledge to design, build and test one. Hi there, I am Carlo Carrano and this is Electronics Engineering Made Easy. In principle, an electronic load is made of just two components, a power transistor and a potentiometer. The transistor can be replaced with the power MOSFET, but the main functionality does not change. What is important is that we have an active device that can be controlled to regulate the flow of the current between the plus and the minus terminals. In this video, I will talk about electronic loads made out of power transistors. The functional principles apply also to a device built around a power MOSFET, but with some substantial difference in the way the current is controlled. With a transistor, we control the high collector current with a small base current, while with a MOSFET we use a voltage on the gate to control the current on the drain. As you can see, we have a potentiometer that provides a fraction of the voltage available at the connectors plus and minus to the base of the transistor. A change in the voltage between base and emitter causes a change in the current through the same junction. The base current is amplified by the transistor because of its beta amplification factor, and that allows us to control the amount of current flowing between collector and emitter, which is obviously larger than the base current. The circuit is very simple, and if you build it, it will actually work somehow. The problem is that this circuit has four main limitations that prevent it from being really useful in a lab environment. Let's go through them. First, because of the high voltage between plus and minus and the current of the collector and emitter terminals or transistors, the transistor itself will have to dissipate a lot of heat. So for this circuit to be any useful, we will need to cool down the transistor, otherwise it will melt and cease to work. Second, before the transistor can be brought into conduction, the voltage between base and emitter has to increase beyond the threshold, which depends on the characteristics of the transistor itself. The result of this circuit is that when we start to slide terminal 2 from 3 to 1 positions, nothing will happen until the terminal 2 has reached a position away from terminal 3, able to inject the right voltage to the base. We are wasting a whole part of the adjustment range of the potentiometer, causing us to rely on a small part of it to regulate the current on the transistor. So we end up making very slight movement of the potentiometer that cause large changes of current in the transistor. One way to solve this problem is to add another resistor in series with pin 3 of the potentiometer, so that the first slight movement of the potentiometer will be enough to pass the threshold of the base voltage and make the current flow. Third, potentiometers are usually low power components. As a result, we can have only a very low current flowing through the potentiometer before it starts heating up and break. To solve this problem, we need to be able to control the high collector current of the transistor with a very low current through the potentiometer and so through the base of the transistor. This means that the transistor must have a very high beta coefficient. The problem can be solved using more than one transistor in what is called a Darlington configuration. We will see how that works shortly. Fourth, but not least, the polarization of the transistor depends on the voltage applied to the terminals plus and minus. 
For different voltages, the values of the potentiometer and the entry the resistor underneath the, the three terminal has to change to obtain the same base value. This can be solved by powering the base circuit of the transistor independently from the voltage of the power supply under test, thus breaking this kind of connection. This means that we will need to create a polarization circuit with its own internal power supply. Let's see how this circuit can be enhanced to overcome the problems we have described. Here is a better way to design an electronic load. You can see that we have addressed at least some of the issues we described with the help of the theoretical schematics. Now, instead of having one single transistor, we have three. I choose these transistors considering what I had available in my lab, other transistors may work as effectively. You can now see the Darlington configuration, where the emitter of one transistor goes directly into the base of the next and the collectors are connected together. You can see that I have added a resistor in series of the potentiometer on the side of its terminal 3. This is the resistor that allows to establish a voltage of the terminal 3 that is very close to the threshold needed to make the current flow between collector and emitter of the Darlington configuration. I also added an ammeter in series to connector plus so we can now measure the current flowing in the circuit. This electronic load works much better than the theoretical one, but there is still one issue that has not been addressed. The polarization of the Darlington configuration on its base here still depends on the value of the voltage between terminals plus and minus. As a result, the resistor R1 should be recalculated and changed for different values of such voltage. Let's see how this can be overcome. Here is the final schematics of my project. As you can see, the main difference is now the additional 9 volt battery added to the left that is used to correctly polarize the Darlington configuration. The resistor R1 and R2, along with the trimmer TR1, are used to allow the potentiometer RV1 to move from minimum and maximum voltages that is applied to the base of Q1 that is exactly in the range needed to provide currents in the whole desired range of the electronic load. In my case, I wanted an electronic load capable of providing a load of up to 5 amps, so I had to calculate the voltages at the terminals 3 and 1 of the potentiometer that allowed me to obtain such full range from 0 to 5 amps at the collector of Q3. The circuit is then completed adding a switch that will allow to power the circuit when it needs to be used. I also added a digital meter that shows both voltage and current between terminals plus and minus. Since it is a digital circuit, I powered it through the same 9 volt battery used to polarize the transistor Q1, Q2 and Q3. To fine-tune the value of trimmer TR1, all is needed is to set the potentiometer to its lower value, 2 to 1, 3, then, starting with the trimmer having the cursor close to the terminal 1, power up the circuit, connect a reference power supply to connector plus and minus, and then move the trimmer cursor down toward 3 until the current to the Darlington suddenly stops. Note that this circuit is theoretically capable of dissipating up to 100 watts with the values of the components I have used, with a max of 50 volts between terminals plus and minus. However, this actual value is limited by the heat sink used to cool down a transistor Q3. With the heat sink I had available, I found that this circuit was not able to dissipate more than 50 watts. To go any further, I should have added a bigger heat sink and probably I should also have added a cooling fan to it. However, for the kind of usage I need from this circuit in my lab, I predicted I would not need more than 50 watt dissipation, so I didn't bother providing a better cooling for Q3. With a 50 watt dissipation, I can still use the load to drain the whole 5 amps limit when the power supply is set to 5 volts. Increasing the level of the voltage between plus and minus terminals, I will have to limit accordingly the amount of drained current. For example, with 10 volts between plus and minus, I could still go to 5 amps, but with 15 volts, I should not go over 3.3 amps, otherwise, I would damage Q3. I could have added some extra circuitry to protect Q3, 
so that I cannot inadvertently increase the current over the limits imposed by the dissipating capabilities of the heat sink. But I decided to leave it as is, for simplicity, and to keep the whole thing cheap. Once more, I decided to print the case for my project rather than buy a case and cut all the holes I needed. Here is how the case looks like in OpenSCAD. If you want to reuse it to make your own electronic load, I put a link to the OpenSCAD code and the corresponding STL file in the description below. And now, let's print it! Here are some pictures showing the final assembly of the device. On the front panel, you can see the digital meter, the power switch, the potentiometer to control the amount of current, and the connectors used to attach the power supply under test. In the inside, there isn't really much, just a small board with the small components, and the rest is directly connected with the appropriate wires. Note the big wires used in the section where the 5 amp max current is supposed to flow. Note also the 9 volts battery used to power the digital meter and to polarize the Darlington configuration of transistors. And finally, this is the completed device, now powered up, but not connected to anything, so the voltmeter and the ammeter are both showing a zero value. Let me give you now a quick demonstration of how the device works. I have connected it to this power supply, which I'm now turning on. I want to leave the voltage set to 5 volts. And now let's power up the device. You can see we can read the 5 volts that are coming from the power supply. And now I'm going to start increasing little by little the current. You can see the current going up over here. And I can keep pushing it. Right now we are about to 260 milliamps. And you can see that basically it's the same as the power supply is showing. Then we keep going up. As you can see, when we increase the current, as slowly the, the voltage here becomes uh, smaller than the one on the power supply. This is because the cables introduce a resistance and therefore the voltage drops along the cables. And the more the, cor the current increases, the more the drop of voltage increases too. And so this voltage diminishes. So let's keep going. Right now we are about 1 amp, and see the voltage is 4.9, let's go up a little bit more, 2 amps, see, and I can go all the way up to 5 amps, which is the maximum for this device. This is still cold for now, it handles perfectly the 25 watts dissipation that now the circuit is doing. As you can see, there is a drop now of 4.5. Uh, I mean, the voltage now is 4.5, which means that there is a drop along the cables of about 0.4 volts, which is expected. If I switch this off, all of a sudden, the current here drops too, because now the, the transistor here and uh, its, uh, its Darlington components is not powered anymore, and so there is no current anymore being drawn. If I turn it on again, you can see it comes up again, and I can still regulate the current, the value of the current, the way I like. 